All right, so last time we saw you, we just opened the case on my Craigslist Datsun motor. It was advertised as being a high-performance L30 with extensive headwork, and for $800, it was a risk I was willing to take. Now, since then, we've discovered that maybe some of those things don't quite check out. But not all hope is lost. What we do have in front of us is something that affords a whole realm of options in terms of how we want to build this thing moving forward. So let's get back into it, see where we're at. So here we have some slightly oversized dish pistons, indicating a bore job of 20 over to the cylinders. The guy who sold me this motor claimed it was an L30, but the math doesn't quite add up here. The likelier story is that the block was mildly bored over during its last rebuild. This slightly increases the displacement of the motor, which can lead to beneficial increases in torque, but it can also lower compression if the volume of the stroke below the deck height is not increased correctly. In simple terms, the rule is as follows. Your compression ratio equals the total volume of the cylinder chamber, V1 plus V2, over the clearance volume or quench area, V1. Something to consider here in terms of bumping up the compression ratio would be removing the dish of the piston itself. Combustion happens at the face of the piston where it extends its travel to the deck of the engine block. Here, under the clearance of the valves coming down from the head, is where combustion happens. This is your quench area or clearance volume. In the interest of a higher compression ratio, you want this area to be as tight as possible without the valves coming into contact with the piston itself. The tighter your quench area, the snappier your combustion cycle is going to be and the higher your subsequent compression will be. The total volume is now in ratio to a smaller clearance volume number. Make sense? Anyway, what we want to do here is decrease the quench area to raise the compression ratio. The first step in doing this is going to be swapping these pistons out for some new flat tops. This motor likely ran with a turbo previously. With a forced induction build, the relief of the dish helps back off the chance of detonation under boost because the dish itself ultimately adds clearance to the quench area. Being as that we're building this thing to be a naturally aspirated street motor, we won't be seeing any benefit from this really so we can bump up the ratio by getting rid of this relief. This will raise the compression. So let's shake these things loose and inspect things a little further. Cool, bearing's still si sitting in the and the journal, which is good. No scoring, you know, none even, no uneven wear, no grit. So now that these pistons are all out, laid out back to front in order how they went in and directions they were in, you can see right now what the difference is between these dish pistons that just came out and the new flat tops that'll be going in in their place. All right, so now that we've gotten this far, the next step for this block is sending it out to get hot tanked. I want this thing cleaned and treated to be in tip-top shape when we go back in for reassembly. No contaminations or carbon or rust in the water jackets, all that's gotta go. To come this far and blast it with some brake clean and keep it moving is pretty short-sighted. Take your time with things like this. And always err on the side of caution and proper preparation. It'll save you the trouble of kicking yourself in the ass later when something goes wrong because you rushed the process. One cool thing we've discovered about the head that came on this thing is that beyond a few messy valve stems here and there, it does have a valve job and ported and polished intake ports, which is great. The exhaust ports do have these liners in them that are meant to burn off any excess hydrocarbons, but flow tests have shown that they don't really impede on the flow at all. Some people remove them, but exhaust flows through and around them well enough that we're not going to get crazy with all that. But we're going to send this out to the machine shop when we have the block hot tanked, just to have it cleaned and treated as well, because why not? Now might be a good time to show you another item we're adding to this build. A Crane 262-272 Twin Duration Cam. Uh, Crane doesn't offer these parts anymore, they don't make these cams, but back when they offered them, they were a pretty hot item. So Mr. Come Up over here found one on eBay one night and I couldn't resist. A Twin Duration Cam refers to when the duration between the intake and exhaust lobes is spread out. In this design, the exhaust valve has a longer duration than the intake valve. 
Therefore, the combustion chamber empties more efficiently through the exhaust throughout the entire RPM range. The further apart these numbers are, and the larger they are, is where you start getting into hot cam characteristics. This would not be described as such, far from to be completely honest. An important thing to remember when addressing the cam choice of your build is this simple rule. Let the reasons of why answer the questions of how. As I've explained already, we're building a streetcar here, something that will spend a lot of time in and around New York City. Heavier, high duration, high lift cams tend to come to life at higher RPMs and they almost always sacrifice low end torque. We don't want that. A lot of guys pick these big stage cams for their cars because they like that aggressive overlapping sound of the running pattern. But at the end of the day, the choice is the least athletic for their car. Consider the analogy of how a triathlete expends energy through his physique versus how a power lifter might. Also, another benefit of using this cam on this head is that it's not too aggressive that the whole valve train will need replacing. The lift of the cam is pretty close to stock and the duration of the cam itself is not too far off either. A stock cam pattern for a 280Z is 242 242 with a 433 lift. This is now 262 272 with a 450 lift. However, these seemingly minor increases in spec end up making a pretty big difference in how the car will perform throughout the power band. Oftentimes with big stage, higher duration cams, you need much stiffer valve springs and beefed up rocker components. With this cam, we should be fine with a stock valve train until 7,000 RPMs or so before any sort of valve flip becomes an issue. And honestly, I don't see the car sitting at redline too much, maybe beyond running out the gears every now and then. We will replace the lash pads and rocker arms as a precaution, because the longer those components run with one particular setup, they tend to take on the characteristics of the cam they were in conversation with. Who knows how long this engine ran with this valve train? We want to eliminate any of those embedded characteristics that the original cam wore into these parts. I just want this thing to be lively throughout the entire RPM range without sacrificing any of the practical measured drivability my environment tends to call for. So a lot of you are probably thinking there's a lot of effort to go through for something that's continuing to resemble stock. No crazy engine swaps, no turbos, but it's important to remember what these cars were when they were stock. This is a stock 280Z. While my buddy Pete's car here is a 1978 model, there is very little difference to how my own 76 would have come from the factory. Both are 2.8 liter inline sixes equipped with a factory five speed and archaic EFI systems. I ended up trading this out for triple carbs in an aftermarket ignition and timing setup, but beyond that, these cars are essentially, at their core, kindred machines. However, certain departures have been made over the course of modifications that allow a version such as mine to celebrate the L-Series engine and S30 chassis as a worthy basis for a very well-tuned streetcar. So scrapping the power plant in lieu of a modern swap completely diminishes all the inherent potential that this car had from the factory. So again, take the model question. How can this car be better? And why do I want to make it better? I bought a 1976 Datsun 280Z. If I wanted an RB, I would have shopped for a Skyline. If I wanted a 2J, I would have considered a Supra. And if I wanted a LS V8, I would have gotten the Chevy Express van or some other bullshit car like that. What's important to remember here is that when you buy a car, you're entering in a particular dialogue with the pedigree and history of that car. And there's a beautiful purity in nailing that down. It's like a fastball pitched right over the plate, straight down the line. Not some wild knuckleball, curveball that barely makes it into the strike zone. What I'm trying to do here is build a car that is recognized straight away as well thought out and properly executed. Because again, here you have two cars that are at their core essentially the same but both do and will continue to tell very different stories based on how they're built. They will both be told in keeping with the traditions of the 280Z.